Hey, uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, so, so we are featuring a series of Harvard professors in this uh, time of shutdown. And I'm very grateful to for Tim Kaxiris for uh, agreeing to give our second colloquium in this series. Uh, Tim uh, got his PhD at MIT and after postdocs at IBM and Naval Research Lab, joined Harvard in 1991 uh, and has been here ever since. He's currently the John Hasbrook Van Leck Professor of Pure and Applied Physics and uh, has done, you know, has a large group of people working on many aspects of materials physics. And uh, so thank you, Tim, and take it away. Okay, uh, thank you, Subir. Now, before I uh, share my screen, I just uh, wanted to take the opportunity and uh, say a few words. I just wanted to say hi to everybody, and thanks for joining this uh, presentation. And thank you to Stephanie for all the help in setting it up. And I know these are uh, strange times. We're not used to doing science like this, but uh, uh, it's probably hard for many people, especially our students and maybe some of our staff also. Uh, so all I want to say is uh, hang in there. Uh, we'll get through this. <laughs> uh, and uh, just to give you a little bit of sense of my own situation, uh, I uh, teach uh, two courses this semester. Uh, and uh, um, I keep uh, teaching them on Zoom. My uh, wife also participates in teaching two courses. Uh, so she's also heavily involved. And uh, our two kids who are both at the college are back at home. So the whole family is on Zoom all day. Uh, and uh, uh, half of the family is teaching courses on Zoom and the other half is attending courses uh, on Zoom. But fortunately, the uh, half who is attending courses on Zoom does not attend the same courses that the other half is uh, teaching. So that, that's uh, good for our sanity. So, okay, so I'll uh, start sharing uh, my screen here. Uh, and uh, hopefully this uh, will work. And, uh, let me go to presentation mode. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to present uh, uh, some of uh, my group's recent work in, on Twistronics, I'll explain what that means, in this uh, Zoom locum. And uh, in, uh, I'm not uh, uh, joking here, I think this is the correct term to use because uh, colloquium comes from uh, the Latin call, which is together, and loqui, which is talk, and we're certainly not together. Uh, so uh, it really is a Zoom locum. Uh, so I'll start with uh, a little bit of uh, a, uh, an overview of my uh, talk. It has three parts, uh, an introduction where I'll uh, give you a little bit of a general perspective and then uh, review some uh, experimental uh, facts. Uh, then uh, the uh, larger part is about uh, single particle uh, theory picture, uh, which we understand quite well now. Uh, and uh, at the end, I have a little bit about uh, our recent and uh, current work. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to also mention that um, uh, I don't mind the uh, interaction. If you want to post questions on uh, chat, uh, that, that's good. Uh, if you feel like uh, you'll benefit from uh, discussing them immediately, I'll be happy uh, to uh, answer some of the questions and I'll try to make some pauses where I see if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, so uh, a little bit of a general introduction. Why uh, two dimensions? Uh, so, um, so my, my, the title of my talk is uh, Twistronics, Manipulating Electronic Behavior in Two-Dimensional Materials. So why two dimensions? Uh, the answer is that uh, the behavior of uh, uh, electrons in materials uh, is quite unusual uh, and quite interesting in two dimensions. And uh, there's a lot of uh, history to this. Uh, there's uh, the very interesting and rich physics of uh, the two-dimensional electron gas, uh, including the uh, quantum Hall effect discovered by von Klitzig, Klitzing and co workers in 1980, the fractional quantum Hall effect discovered by Tsui, Stormer, and Gossard, and explained by Laughlin, the quantum anomalous Hall effect uh, proposed by Haldane, and uh, what's actually my uh, personal favorite uh, of these uh, types of ideas and, and uh, uh, theories the edge states in the quantum Hall effect proposed by our own uh, Bert Halperin 
And uh, here's a picture trying to capture this. So this has to do with the behavior in st of states in Landau levels uh, at the edges of the sample, which are able to perform this skipping motion and, and go through the entire sample uh, without being uh, affected by uh, impurities or imperfections and so on. So uh, creating a two-dimensional uh, electron gas is not easy with three-dimensional crystals. So it's um, easy to conceive of a situation theoretically. So that's what this is, a, a theory of uh, uh, a quantum well, uh, an insulator on one side and a semiconductor on the other, creating states uh, in the direction perpendicular to the plane. And if only the lowest energy state is populated, then all the electrons will live essentially on this plane. Uh, and here's the experimental uh, version of this, where you have to put together different uh, uh, materials, uh, carefully doped and uh, uh, very flat uh, at the surfaces, at the interfaces. And the two-dimensional electron gas lives on this sliver between the different materials, which must be very uh, uh, appropriately doped. Uh, so I, I, the details of this are not very important, but uh, the fact is that it took uh, several decades and, and uh, a lot of really difficult experimental work to achieve this. So uh, in the last uh, decade or so, there, uh, there has been a cornucopia of uh, two-dimensional materials. So now we have materials that are themselves uh, essentially a two-dimensional layer. So the electrons are forced to exist in that layer. And we have been uh, uh, actually blessed or maybe even spoiled by our experimental colleagues who have managed to produce a wealth of these materials, including different types of semiconductors, uh, illustrated uh, schematically here, uh, metals. Graphene is the uh, prototypical example of a metal, a two-dimensional metal. Uh, insulators, there's uh, several of those, and even superconductors in some of the conventional uh, um, Superconductors uh, are essentially two-dimensional in nature, and more of them have been discovered recently. So the big question is how to combine all these materials to make even more exciting devices and study more interesting physics. Uh, so there's this picture that uh, was published uh, a while back by uh, Gaim and uh, Grigoreva. And uh, in this picture, they suggest that uh, putting together these materials is like stacking layers of uh, Legos. Uh, and you can make very interesting structures. But uh, in fact, the situation is uh, quite a bit uh, different. And what I'm going to argue is that uh, the stacking of these materials doesn't look anything like Legos uh, because uh, Legos are very nicely structured to fit exactly one on top of each other. These materials do not fit well with each other. And even if they're slightly misaligned, the layers of the same material don't quite fit very well. And this, creates all sorts of uh, really interesting possibilities and in fact enriches the physics, makes it even more exciting. Uh, and uh, related to these new materials, uh, the exploration of new fundamental physics has been possible. For example, the uh, topological states, this is a schematic presentation of the topological states which are surface states and in two dimensions these states live at the uh, perimeter of the sample, at the edges of the sample. So this is a an example of a topological illustrator and uh, uh, insulator and illustration. Uh, and uh, using these kinds of situations, you can have uh, interesting physics like in the quantum spin hall effect proposed by Kane and Mali, or the anomalous hall effect proposed by Haldane and realized in some of these structures. Uh, and uh, it is possible to create even new types of uh, situations uh, in terms of the behavior of electrons beyond what uh, we are. Uh, used to. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, uh, combination of uh, molybdenum disulfide and tungsten diselenide uh, in this uh, arrangement, this is work from Philip Kim's group uh, for, from a few years back, pro produces interesting behavior in the sense that uh, excitations in this uh, system, in this uh, two semiconductor system, uh, produce interlayer excitons. And because of this, the excitons behave in interesting ways possibly leading to uh, Bose-Einstein condensation of excitons and so on. So in uh, our work, and in fact, in, in uh, most uh, groups uh, working in this area, the, there are three very popular classes of materials. 
Uh, one is uh, graphene, which is the metal that I mentioned. It has a zero uh, band gap, uh, and uh, uh, it can be uh, in a single or a few layered uh, structure. Uh, there is a very interesting family of uh, semiconductors. They're called uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, and they have different back band gaps depending on the number of layers, monolayer or multilayer uh, structures they have different band gaps, uh, and of course, depending on the composition of the material. So, and finally, the uh, insulator, hexagonal boron nitride, which has a wide band gap and uh, is a very nice flat uh, material for insulating, for uses uh, as an insulator. And uh, using exactly this range of materials, people have been uh, making devices, real devices. Here's an example with hex hexagonal boron nitride at the top and at the bottom and uh, graphene in between to conduct the electrons and uh, a molybdenum disulfide uh, few layer system here where the electrons are excited and, and so on. And these kinds of devices can give uh, really uh, uh, quite uh, unusual behavior, faster uh, communication and so on. So what made things even more exciting is the possibility of arranging different layers, for example, two layers, uh, with a small relative twist between them. And here's a, again examples from uh, Philip Kim's group. This is graphene on graphene, uh, and this is molybdenum disulfide on molybdenum disulfide, showing very nice, uh, interesting patterns uh, due to the small twist angle between the different layers, illustrated briefly here. And uh, this is how our experimental uh, colleagues can do this. And it's really quite extraordinary because it allows them to have control of the twist angle to close to a tenth of a degree and maybe even better these days. So the way they do it is they have, uh, let's say, one layer of uh, a two-dimensional material like graphene. They stick on it a different uh, material like uh, boron nitride and uh, on half of the graphene. Then they uh, lift up this half, so the graphene is torn into two pieces, but now you know exactly the relative orientation of these two pieces. So you twist the top a little bit and deposit back on the bottom and you have these well uh, oriented uh, with very uh, good control of the twist angle uh, different layers. And here's another example, a very large area of uh, twisted uh, bilayer graphene. Uh, with a twist uh, in the range between 0.1 and 0.2 degrees, again from uh, Philip, uh, groups, uh, Philip Kim's uh, group. Uh, and what you see here is a dark field image uh, by uh, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, revealing these patterns, and I will explain these, uh, that come from the relative twist. So uh, basically, the, what you see is a Muare pattern uh, from the two different layers. Uh, so this is an atomistic uh, scale picture of uh, the top layer, and this is the bottom layer, and uh, the combination produces this moiré pattern at a length scale much larger than the atomic length scale. But I want to emphasize that this is not a periodic structure, and uh, for an arbitrary uh, uh, twist, this is an uh, incommensurate type of uh, stacking. And it does produce interesting effects. Uh, these are experiments from the group of uh, Pablo Jarillo Herrero, uh, and uh, uh, what you see in this uh, 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 figure here is the diagonal uh, uh, component of uh, the conductivity as a function of uh, doping. This is the number of carriers. Uh, zero is uh, the uh, zero doping, uh, and uh, uh, above is uh, above zero is uh, uh, doping with electrons. Below is doping with uh, holes. And you see, even though this is a graphene, so these are uh, states in twisted bilayer graphene, uh, you do observe band gaps. I mentioned earlier that graphene has no band gaps. It's a metal. Uh, so uh, the twist of the two layers introduced a very interesting uh, different behavior. And uh, here's another set of measurements, also from uh, the same uh, uh, experiment. Uh, showing the behavior of uh, states when you introduce an external electric, uh, excuse me, uh, magnetic field. And again, as a function of doping, you observe this uh, behavior of uh, the off diagonal part of uh, the uh, uh, conductivity. And uh, these lines are an interpretation of the conductivity, which is proportional to 
the uh, number of uh, carriers divided by the Landau level index. And you see that in these lines, the Landau level index jumps by eight for this range of values of doping. For the, another range of values of doping, the index jumps by four. And again, this is uh, uh, hole conductivity, uh, uh, quantum hole uh, uh, effect physics, and Landau level is observed, but with uh, their own peculiar behavior. The most uh, uh, exciting, possibly, uh, observation was uh, superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene at a magic angle. Here's a picture of the device, uh, and here are <coughs> the measurements. Uh, so this is a uh, current voltage measurement showing this uh, superconducting behavior once the temperature has fallen down to something below one degree. So the critical temperature is about one degree Kelvin, uh, and uh, the Carrier density is quite low, about roughly two orders of magnitude uh, smaller than typical carrier densities in, in uh, semiconductors, uh, two-dimensional semiconductors. And here are the two uh, references which uh, uh, reported this uh, very exciting uh, discovery. Uh, and uh, at the magic angle, uh, superconductivity is uh, um, uh, not only interesting but quite similar to what is seen in the cuprates and the high temperature superconductors. So here's uh, uh, a plot of the conductance as a function of the doping again. This is uh, essentially the number of carriers and uh, this region now is blown up here, this range of uh, doping and the vertical axis is the temperature and you see this phase diagram. This is superconducting phase and another superconducting phase. Uh, metallic phases here and here and a mod insulator here. So this is at the twist angle of 1.16 degrees and this is at 1.05 degrees. And there's uh, definitely, definitely a lot of similarities with the phase diagram of uh, high TC cuprates with superconducting phases, uh, uh, metallic phases and uh, uh, insulating phases, the under, under ferromagnetic phase and so on. So this created a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, moreover, it was suggested by uh, uh, this uh, uh, work that uh, the, the twisted bilayer graphene is actually a high temperature superconductor par excellence. Uh, and what is meant by this is that uh, if you plot the critical temperature versus the Fermi temperature, and this is a measure of the number of electrons, you realize that uh, this is where uh, twisted bilayer graphene lies. And uh, uh, the ratio of those two numbers is higher than it would be in the various uh, copper oxides. Uh, so here's uh, in the inset again, a plot of this ratio, and here are the points for graphene, and this is the line for uh, high TC cuprates, and you see it really is a highly correlated system. So by the way, uh, uh, the issue of uh, room temperature superconductivity has been solved uh, recently and uh, it's uh, something related to the coronavirus um, um, uh, crisis. And uh, if you have any uh, question about that, I'll be happy to answer at the very end of my talk. So uh, I'm going to pause here for a second and see if there are any questions because this concludes the introductory part of my talk before I go into the uh, theory that tries to analyze and interpret all these results. So if you, if you want to ask any questions, this is a good time. You can unmute your microphone and, and talk. Uh, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, something's wrong with my video so you won't be able to see me, but uh, I have a question. Uh, basically, what is the motivation for making 2D devices and why do we want to stack them? And could you please tell me that with reference to the, uh, the faster communication example you were talking about? Yes. Well, the, uh, as I said in the very beginning, you know, by confining the electrons in a two-dimensional plane, you get a lot of interesting effects. Now, stacking them on top of each other gives you the possibility of having very interesting devices like the one that I showed where you have a semiconductor in the middle, you excite electrons there, and those electrons are then taken away by the metal and it's all in two dimensions. And uh, this can uh, be an arrangement that corresponds to much faster uh, uh, data management and, and uh, information management because you are in two dimensions. And there's a lot of possibilities of uh, new devices as well as the physics that I was mentioning earlier. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, 
So let me move on to the theory part. So uh, our goal is to build a realistic picture of uh, single particle states uh, of uh, uh, twisted bilayer graphene and other similar systems, then explore some implications. And at the very end, I hope I have the time to even mention a little bit about challenging the idea that uh, superconductivity in these uh, systems has to do exclusively with electron-electron interactions. Uh, but first, I want to give you a very quick review of the physics of single layer graphene uh, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page on this. Uh, so here's graphene. It's a, in real space, uh, the atomic structure is a honeycomb lattice of uh, two carbon atoms per unit cell. Here's the unit cell, the repeat vectors and the carbon atoms that form the bases labeled A and B. So those are also referred to as sub lattices. And in reciprocal space, the um, uh, the system has a hexagonal Brillouin zone outlined here, and this is the irreducible part of the Brillouin zone uh, where we do all the calculations. So basically, we want to solve the Schrodinger equation and calculate eigenvalues and, and eigenfunctions with um, the Fermi, excuse me, the, the k vector in the irreducible part of the Brillouin zone. Here's the uh, Brillouin zone again in perspective, and this is the energy. Uh, in uh, the kx and ky uh, components uh, of the wave vector. Uh, and uh, this is a small region of the uh, energy versus k vector diagram, uh, this, this small region around the Fermi level. So uh, the shaded is occupied levels, the empty is unoccupied levels. And you see these characteristic bands of graphene, which near the Fermi level have this behavior of the Dirac cones. Uh, where the energy is proportional to the magnitude of the momentum. Uh, and this is quite unusual for solids, so these are referred to as massless electrons at the Fermi level. Uh, another important feature is the density of states. So we plot the density of states on the horizontal axis and keep the vertical axis for the energy. This is the Fermi level, and for graphene, the density of states at the Fermi level is zero. Uh, so it's a metal, but a very poor metal. So you need to dope it a little bit to get metallic uh, states. Uh, and uh, if you go away from the Fermi level, you do get a significant density of states, the, the so-called Van Hoop singularities, which correspond to flat bands. But these are very far from the Fermi level, several electron volts. So it's impossible to access these regions just simply by doping the material. And you do want high density of states in order to be able to manipulate the properties of the device. So let's go to the twisted version of uh, uh, graphene, twisted bilayer graphene, and the moiré pattern that I was uh, uh, mentioning earlier. So this comes from the stacking of the two layers, and you get regions like this, where the two layers are on top of each other. The top layer uh, completely hides the bottom layer. Uh, and these are referred to as AA regions. Uh, and there are other regions where the top layer, here it's shown again, hides only half of the atoms of the bottom layer. So you see the other half of the bottom layer atoms. And these are referred to as AB or BA stackings. They're equivalent by symmetry. And in between these regions, you get these domain walls. So you get these three important features, AA stackings, which happen to be high energy stackings, AB or BA stackings, which are the low energy stackings, and finally, the domain walls between those regions. Uh, and here are the Brillouin zones of the bilayer system. So you get a Brillouin zone from uh, one layer, uh, the blue one, and uh, the, another Brillouin zone from the other layer, the red one, twisted relative to each other. And uh, the uh, arrangement introduces this supercell Brillouin zone. So this basically corresponds to the periodicity if you are dealing with the periodic system of the supercell. And now, related to each one of these uh, uh, large Brillouin zones is a set of Dirac cones. So there's a Dirac cone from each layer uh, at these corners uh, uh, of the supercell Brillouin zone. So that's what we have to deal with in a uh, twisted bilayer graphene. So the first question is what are the effects of the twist on the band? And I'll start with a qualitative picture. And I must uh, give credit here to Alan McDonald and his co-workers who first put together this uh, very uh, important basic qualitative picture of what is happening. So here again is the supercell Brillouin zone that I showed you a moment ago with the two sets of Dirac cones, one from the one layer 
the blue one and another from the other layer, the red one, and here they are again. These are now cross sections of the Dirac uh, cones. Uh, and uh, uh, there are three effects of the twist. First of all, these two Dirac cones, the blue and the red one, intersect at these points. And the distance between these points where they intersect uh, which is called two times delta E, this distance in energy, the vertical uh, axis here is energy, is set by the Moiré pattern, the length scale of the Moiré pattern. The second effect is that uh, the degeneracies at uh, these points of intersection will be split when you turn on the interaction between layers and uh, this splitting, this amount of splitting will depend on the interaction between layers and this is referred to as the 2W energy scale. Uh, and finally, because of this splitting, the bands will be uh, uh, bent and uh, their slope, uh, the Fermi uh, uh, energy, uh, excuse me, uh, um, velocity associated with the slope of these bands will change. So there's a renormalization of the Fermi velocity uh, because of the bending of the bands. And you can imagine that uh, if you arrange the, these two different energy scales in just the right way, you might make these uh, bands associated with the twisted bilayer very flat. And uh, in this case, the uh, very interesting effects happen. So here's the density of states associated with the uh, new bands. And for comparison, this would be schematically the density of states of graphene. And by creating these new bands, you make density of states which is much higher near the Fermi level. And in the limit when these bands are very, very flat, the density of states will become infinite. So uh, we're going to have a realistic theory based on uh, the atomic structure of uh, this system. And we do have the tools to perform such realistic calculations. Uh, the computational scheme is referred to as density functional theory, uh, which was developed in uh, the mid 60s by Hohenberg, Cohn, and Sham, and has evolved into a very versatile and, and useful tool. These are the equations for density functional theory. Now I presented all this in detail in the previous colloquium that I gave in the physics department when I was up for tenure. So I'm not gonna bother you with, the with any of these details. Okay, so this theory provides an excellent description of single particle states. And there are many checks on this from experiment. It contains no adjustable parameters, so we can uh, say that it really is an ab initio theory. It allows predictions, in, uh, which makes it possible to guide experiments uh, uh, for search of interesting phenomena or explanations of uh, what is being observed. And finally, it provides a good check for the qualitative picture. Will the qualitative picture that I just mentioned hold up uh, when you perform such detailed and realistic calculations? But there are some limitations. This kind of approach can only handle of order 100 or at most 1,000 atoms. And as I mentioned, the length scales in the twisted bilayers are much larger. Uh, and the uh, uh, periodic cells involve many, many more atoms. Uh, and the whole description is based on the crystal structure involving uh, block states, Brillouin zones, K vectors, and so on, pretty much like uh, the uh, features that I described in the review of uh, single layer graphene. And this actually introduces a problem because as I mentioned, when you have an arbitrary twist angle, you have incommensurate layers. So momentum is not a good number, uh, not a good quantum number any longer. So how can we describe such a system in an accurate way? Well, the answer to this uh, uh, very basic uh, uh, computational limitation came uh, from uh, uh, a mathematical analysis uh, and it's referred to as working in configuration space. So the basic idea is that you have this kind of moiré pattern again uh, with uh, an overall uh, 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 apparent periodic cell, and you can focus on in different regions and look at the local environment of uh, the atom in one layer, uh, depending on where the atoms in the other layer are. Uh, so the two layers here are colored uh, red and, and blue. And you find lots of different local environments depending on where you are, and you can describe those in configuration space. So this came from uh, a very nice uh, mathematical formulation by the these authors, the group of Mitchell Luskin at the University of Minnesota. And what basically tells us is that instead of uh, taking integrals over k-space, which is what we typically have to do in order to 
uh, calculate physical observables, we can calculate now the same quantities, but integrating over all the local configuration space uh, arrangements. So omega, small omega, the, uh, identifies the local environments as uh, illustrated here. And uh, uh, capital omega is the entire space of local environments. So this integral provides the uh, tool for calculating the physical uh, observables in this situation. And we can uh, scan the local configuration spaces by uh, uh, shifting and twisting finite ranges uh, of the system. So in order to do this, you need a Hamiltonian with finite range. And uh, the um, uh, crystal structure essentially involves uh, wave functions that have infinite range. Uh, they uh, extend over the entire system. So these are called block states, the extended states. So we want to turn the block states into localized states. So Fortunately, there is a very nice methodology for that. And this is work that uh, uh, my student, uh, Shang Fang, uh, this is a really excellent student uh, who uh, was a member of my group and, and performed many beautiful uh, calculations. Uh, so, uh, so the methodology is called uh, uh, maximally localized uh, Vanier functions. This is a methodology developed by uh, David Vanderbilt and uh, collaborators. And it basically uh, does a, a linear transformation from the block states that I mentioned earlier uh, with index the wave uh, vector to the localized Vanier states. And the transformation matrix here, which is not uniquely determined, uh, can be chosen to minimize the extent of the Vanier functions. So uh, we can then take the Cohn-Sham Hamiltonian, which is uh, written in, uh, in terms of the band structure and the block states, and turn it into a localized uh, Hamiltonian in the basis of these localized states, which makes it possible to diagonalize this sparse Hamiltonian for very large systems. Uh, so uh, the range of these uh, uh, transformed uh, uh, basis uh, functions is, is very narrow. And uh, this approach does not in involve fitting of parameters. So we can again claim that we're working with an ab initio tight binding Hamiltonian. And just to give you a glimpse of what these states look like. So these are the Vanier orbitals for bilayer graphene, and they can be decomposed into states uh, uh, of different uh, angular momentum. The zero angular momentum state looks like the PZ orbital, the atomic carbon orbital, which is often taken as the basis. So the basis is actually quite a bit more elaborate uh, in its behavior, in its angular dependence. So putting these kinds of orbitals at every point in the, uh, in the graphene lattice of layer one and every other point in the graphene lattice of layer two and allowing for all these interactions gives us a good handle of uh, the uh, electronic states uh, that result from this uh, bilayer system. So using this formulation, so Shang was able to model what happens when you dope this bilayer system. And uh, this is basically moving the Fermi level up and down and uh, produces these uh, 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 constant energy contours. Uh, one example is shown here. And by simply counting now the degeneracies of these constant energy contours, you can easily account for the degeneracies, the total degeneracy, which uh, gives you a handle of uh, the uh, jumps in the Landau level index and very nicely explains what is seen here in experiment, as I mentioned earlier. So for this range of doping. And for a different range of doping, you have different constant energy contours, which explains this uh, uh, set of jumps between uh, Landau level uh, uh, indices. So taking this uh, one step uh, further, uh, uh, <coughs> Stephen Carr, uh, another uh, really excellent uh, student in my group. Uh, by the way, all, all the students in my group are <laughs> really excellent. Uh, so he did uh, a very nice set of calculations. Uh, so now I'm plotting here the density of states on the vertical axis and also color coded, yellow being highest, as a function of the twist angle on this axis, the y axis, and as a function of the energy on the x axis. So the zero angle results shown here uh, correspond to the density of states of uh, two layers of graphene uh, untwisted, uh, just uh, on top of each other. 
And as you change the twist value, you get these very interesting effects. And in this range, you get a very high density of states, which is really quite uh, interesting and exciting. And notice that this now is at the Fermi level. So you don't need a lot of doping to access this very high density of states created by the small twist angle of uh, roughly one degree in the twisted bilayer graphene system. So this was very exciting when uh, uh, we saw this. Uh, so we coined the term twistronics to describe this. Uh, so this was actually published in uh, uh, it was in the title of our paper, and uh, it was uh, later picked up by uh, uh, popular magazines like uh, Physics World with a uh, an article entitled "Twistronics Tunes 2D Materials Properties," or even Wired magazine uh, with an article uh, entitled "Physicists Are Bewitched by Graphene's Magic Angle." and uh, making even extravagant claims that uh, now we, are, uh, we have the coming age of twistronics. So this is a little bit extravagant, but it's not my word, so I don't feel bad uh, uh, quoting them. Actually, I feel happy quoting them. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is what happens in uh, the bilayer system. In real space, you have highly localized electrons. So this is the number of electrons in real space as they are distributed in the actual graphene system and you see this very high concentration and it so happens that these uh, uh, peaks in concentration of electrons are in the areas where you have AA stacking. This is the high energy stacking of the two layers. And in uh, uh, momentum uh, space you see these very flat uh, bands uh, near the Fermi level. Here, here's another picture. So here are the kx, ky uh, components of uh, the uh, wave vector, and here are the bands in a two-dimensional space, which can be quite flat. And flat bands, of course, correspond to high density of states. So you see here the high density of states associated with this. And for comparison, the graphene density of states must be multiplied by a factor of a thousand to be visible on the same scale. So uh, with these uh, realistic and, and accurate calculations, we can uh, uh, do uh, uh, more interesting things. For example, consider what happens if we put the system under pressure. So what you see here is uh, a certain twist angle, 1.12 degrees, and uh, 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 the flat bands that I just mentioned highlighted in uh, red. Then a different angle here, uh, 1.47 uh, degrees, and the bands here are not that flat. But if you compress these layers by 5%, you get again very flat bands. Uh, alternatively, you can put a different twist angle, two degrees. Again, the bands are not flat at all uh, at zero uh, uh, compression, but they become very, very flat at 10% uh, compression. And uh, you can uh, express this compression uh, between the two layers to an equivalent uh, pressure uh, here in a giga, gigapascal range. Uh, and you can create this uh, uh, phase diagram of the magic angle for flat bands at any uh, angle. So this was uh, work that uh, uh, was performed by uh, uh, Stephen Carr. Uh, and it was uh, uh, verified by experiment uh, a, a little bit later. So these are experiments from uh, the group of uh, uh, Corey Dean and uh, 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 Jim, James Hohn at uh, Columbia. And uh, here are the two different uh, measurements. The gray line is uh, uh, <clears throat> at uh, zero pressure, zero gigapascal. The blue line is at 2.21 gigapascal. The twist angle is 1.27 degrees. And the blue line indicates this behavior characteristic of the superconducting or flat band structure. Uh, so at 1.27 degrees, it takes 2.2 gigapascals to create flat bands. And this is exactly what our theory was predicting, or very, very close to what uh, our theoretical predictions were. So the million dollar question is, where do these flat bands come from? And this is not an easy question to answer. So early, an early attempt by uh, Ashwin and, and his uh, uh, students and, and postdocs and, and Senthill from uh, MIT was to use uh, uh, symmetry arguments to figure out how the bands look, what is the shape of the bands if you assume different types of symmetries. But uh, through this analysis, uh, it was possible to formulate uh, what kind of symmetries must be at play 
to have the shape of the bands that is being observed. But it turns out that uh, if you uh, take that a step further, you, you find very strange wave functions for these states, suggesting that maybe two bands alone are not enough to describe the system. So in order to really nail down the question, you have to take into consideration the atomic structure. So here are the results of our atomic structure relaxation calculations. So we have the tools to do that as well. I don't have time to explain the details, but let's just look at the results. So what you see here are top views of the atomic relaxation patterns at different twist angles. As you go down the column, the twist angle becomes smaller and smaller. It's two degrees here, one degree, half a degree, and so on. And this is graphene, and the other two columns are for molybdenum disulfide. And uh, there are two sub-columns in each case. Uh, so this one is for configuration space. This is for real space relaxation. So let's look at the real space relaxation because it's a little bit easier to interpret. So uh, red is... Uh, uh, high energy, uh, black is low energy. So you see that uh, at two degrees, there's um, a mixture of high energy and low energy domains. Uh, and uh, as you make the twist angle smaller and smaller, starting at about uh, one degree, the regions clearly separate. So there's the high energy regions, red, which correspond to AA stacking, and low energy regions, which correspond to AB or BA stacking domains. Uh, and these are the black regions, and the white lines are the uh, domain walls between them. And uh, from this range of values of twist angle and below, nothing changes in the pattern. The only thing that changes is the black regions, the low energy regions expand and become larger. Similar effects are shown here in uh, twisted uh, uh, bilayer molybdenum disulfide. This can be stacked in two different ways. That's why you see two different patterns. And this nicely explains experimental measurements. So this is the molybdenum disulfide crystal in perspective, two different types of atoms, two different possible stackings. This is the stacking that makes it look like graphene. This is the different stacking with very different patterns of domain walls and very close to what we predict by uh, our theoretical analysis. So in a nutshell, this is what the atomic relaxation looks like, where you now see both the in-plane relaxation color-coded, as well as the out-of-plane relaxation. The atoms relax uh, perpendicular to the plane as well. So here are the AA regions uh, highlighted as red, with atoms moving away from each other in the two layers, and the AB or BA regions, which are the low-energy ones, uh, where the atoms move closer to each other between the two layers. And uh, related to this are very important effects on the band structure. So here's the band structure again. And here are the bands associated with this relaxed atomic configuration. So the black lines are from our ab initio type binding Hamiltonians. The red lines are an effective perturbation theory, which basically capture all the important uh, features. So this is with full relaxation and it's very realistic, corresponding to the experimental measurements. Without the relaxation, the bands are actually a bit of a mess. No gaps here separating the, these two bands from the rest, and uh, uh, really very uh, uh, mixed, which is unrealistic. So going back to the superconductivity uh, observations in twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle, you see that what I just showed you uh, actually creates a big puzzle because I showed you uh, a moment ago these two bands, which are separated by band gaps from the rest. They are pretty flat, and that gives the large density of states. And here's essentially on the vertical axis the density of states as a function of energy relative to the Fermi level. The Fermi level is at zero. And uh, you see that you have this a gap here and another gap on the other end. Uh, and uh, this is the range where the two bands should appear. But then you have additional gaps in the middle of the bands, and there's no way that uh, uh, band theory can account for that. So uh, basically what uh, this picture suggests is that uh, there's a breakdown of band theory. So uh, uh, in a very schematic way, a single band fully occupied with two electrons per site would look like that. Uh, a band 
half occupied with uh, 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 half an electron will spin up and half an electron will spin down per side would look like that, but there's no way to develop a gap in the middle of such a band as you see here. So here's one band with a gap in the middle. Here's another band with a gap in its middle. So the idea then is that we need more than band theory. We need the many particle picture to describe this, for instance, using the Mott Hubbard insulator idea where the uh, bands split into subbands because of the correlated electron motion as suggested very uh, schematically here. This is not a realistic picture. It's just to show you that you can have one electron per site that's half a band and the lower half band is occupied with a band gap because these electrons cannot hop around because of the large repulsion energy when you have two electrons on the same side. So that's the idea of the Mott Hubbard insulator going beyond uh, band theory to try to address this. So, uh, so in order to now capture the physics using a Mott Hubbard insulator picture, uh, you need to have uh, as uh, few single particle states as possible to uh, uh, make a realistic scenario and also check it uh, uh, numerically. Uh, and this is not easy if you have uh, uh, many states. So hence the quest for a minimal basis single particle model. So we've been working closely with Ashvin's group to produce such a minimal basis uh, model. So here is the full set of bands that we need to describe everything from our ab initio theory. Here's a subset of eight bands around the Fermi level capturing at least the essential behavior. Here's uh, a, a smaller set of uh, five bands, just the flat ones near the Fermi level and three above, or the flat ones near the Fermi level and three bands below. This is about as uh, uh, small as you can get with a basis, because below that you start losing the essential physics. Why is this? Because uh, the two bands right here at the middle are not enough, as I alluded to earlier. We know this because we also know the wave functions of these bands. So here's again the total band structure, and here are the projections of the bands on different wave functions. So the orange parts correspond to wave functions that are near the AA regions. So here I have projections of the bands in different layers. So this is layer one sublattice A, layer one sublattice B, layer two sublattice A, layer two sublattice B, and the last column is the total wave function. So the orange uh, parts are near the AA regions. So here again you see this pattern of high energy AA stacking, the low energy stacking are the black regions and the domain walls in between. So the purple bands are on the domain walls and the green bands are on the AB or BA regions. And you see that the flat bands in the middle here near the Fermi level contain behavior of electrons near the AA regions as well as on the walls. And in fact, the two bands change character as you go through the critical value, the magic angle. So the valence band, the whole band, uh, which is uh, below the Fermi level, has AA character, is mostly concentrated in these orange regions. And the conduction band, the uh, 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 unoccupied states have uh, domain wall character if the critical angle excuse me, if the twist angle is a little below the critical value, if you make the twist angle a little bit above the critical value, the nature of these states change. So they're really very closely interrelated states. Moreover, we have strong evidence that uh, the critical value of the twist angle to produce all these interesting effects is not just one single unique value, but it's a small range of values of width about 0.05 degrees. And in fact, that makes a lot of sense because if it were a single unique value, it would be very hard to hit that specific unique value in experiments. The fact that it's a range of values, uh, roughly in the range that the experiment can uh, manage to control the twist angle, uh, makes it much more reasonable and feasible to hit that range of values where you have this very interesting behavior. So here's where we are. Uh, that's what we understand from uh, single uh, uh, particle theory. 
And uh, there's a lot of uh, really interesting and important efforts to put all this picture together in a many body theory. But uh, so far, uh, we're not quite there yet. And I'm quoting now from another uh, article here. For the time being, all we know is that um, the correlated states come from electron electron interaction. Uh, and uh, the ground state uh, and the interaction mechanisms between these uh, quantum particles remains a mystery for now. And this is a very nice illustration, sort of lifting one of the two layers to peek underneath and see what the correlated motion is. Uh, it's a little bit unrealistic because if you lift one layer, then you completely destroy the correlations, but let's not worry about that. So that's just an illustration. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so this is another good point to uh, uh, take a quick uh, uh, break, a pause, and see if there are any questions. So I hear uh, no questions, so I'm going to continue. With, I don't uh, see any bit. hands raised. Pardon? I don't see any hands raised, I think you're Okay, right. good. So I'll continue and, and uh, save the questions for the end. Okay, so, uh, so what I want to uh, uh, tell you for the last uh, few minutes uh, is a little bit about more recent work. So the current work, uh, it involves trying to understand the twisted tri-layer system, three layers of graphene. So here again is the schematic picture of the two layers that I mentioned earlier, the twisted bilayer graphene. Here's the twisted tri-layer graphene with an extra Dirac cone. So before we had the blue and the red Dirac cones intersecting here. Now we have the red, the uh, blue, and uh, one more, the black Dirac cone, all of them intersecting. So two of the intersections uh, are here and produce the flat bands and there's one more Dirac cone here. But this is a much more complicated uh, uh, system because instead of the single twist angle that we had before and a cell size, a moiré cell size of order one over theta, theta being the twist angle, now we have two different independent twist angles uh, between the uh, 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 two layers relative to the middle layer, between the top and bottom layer relative to the middle one. And the cell size turns out to be uh, 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 roughly uh, proportional to one over the twist angle square. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, our experimental colleagues, in this case, uh, Ke Wang, uh, who is a former postdoc of uh, Philip Kims, now uh, a faculty member at the University of Minnesota, were able to produce such a system and make measurements of um, uh, the uh, different phases. So here's the temperature axis again, here's the doping, the number of carriers, and the dark blue corresponds to superconductivity. And uh, this is shown schematically here where they try to measure the superconducting temperature that turns out to be about 3.4 degrees Kelvin, quite a bit higher than the uh, bilayer system. And moreover, the uh, twist angles are much larger here. So they're of order two or three degrees rather than one degree as uh, the magic twist angle in bilayer graphene. So what is going on here? Well, uh, this is not an easy system to uh, analyze because of the complexity that I mentioned a moment ago. And fortunately, I have another uh, really amazing student, uh, Zoe Zhu, who is involved in these calculations. So he, this is an example of uh, Zoe's work in collaboration with uh, 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 Stephen and, and Shang and other members of my group, showing this kind of pattern, which we call a muare of muare. So you have two sets of muare patterns because of the two different pairs on top of each other. And you get very interesting uh, additional uh, uh, effects in the atomic position. So these are uh, pictures of the atomic positions involved in the local twist angles and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the most uh, interesting aspect is what happens to the electronic states associated with this. Uh, by the way, these are really um, tour de force calculations that uh, Zoe was able to uh, uh, carry out and, and she really is uh, uh, fearless. I mean, this is a difficult problem. So here are the three brilliant zones associated with the three different layers twisted relative to each other. Uh, and this is the supercell uh, uh, structure. And you can scan now this uh, K space in different directions. Uh, this is a, what do we call type one scan along this triangle or type two scan along these two uh, 
sides of the uh, uh, Brillouin zones of the individual pairs. So this is the Brillouin zone of pair one, two, and this is the Brillouin zone of pair two, three, the supercell uh, Brillouin zones. So here for reference is the twisted bilayer uh, result at two degrees. The bands are not flat here. So uh, then I'll do, I'll show you a scan uh, uh, around this area. So here it is. And you see the, essentially the twisted bilayer bands and an additional Dirac cone. This is with the interaction between layers two and three turned off. So this is only for layers one and two interacting, producing these bands and the layer three producing the Dirac cone. You turn the, so this is the third layer Dirac cone. So you turn the interaction on and you get this complete mess of bands. There are some flat bands in the middle, but lots of other bands due to the more complicated system. And if you take a different cross section through K space, the type two cross section, you still see lots of uh, interesting features, including some flat bands, but bands all over the place as well. So there are no gaps here, no, uh, uh, few states separated at the Fermi level from all the other states, as we had in uh, 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 bilayer graphene, these bands, which eventually became the flat bands near the Fermi level, separated from all the rest by the band gaps. So there is no equivalent of Hubbard insulator behavior here, as far as we can tell from our calculations. So it may be uh, uh, a very interesting system to study from also a very different perspective. Now very quickly, uh, Stephen is involved in doing similar analysis of uh, localized uh, states in uh, bilayer molybdenum disulfide, diselenide and similar materials and again we see localized states and delocalized states depending on where you probe the, uh, uh, the different bands and you essentially can turn this into a configuration space set of bands, real space bands, a very nice uh, uh, duality argument that uh, Stephen has put together in a very uh, uh, beautiful theoretical uh, formulation. Uh, a postdoc in my group, uh, George Tritsaris, is working on developing the uh, methodology and the software to do high throughput calculations and modeling where you can have any arrangement of uh, layers that you want. You even need a special language to describe these arrangements in the computer and then quickly calculate the band structures. Hopefully this will be very helpful to our experimental colleagues to guide their searches for interesting behavior. And uh, Daniel Larson, uh, another uh, postdoc in my group, is looking at the possibility of doping now these systems with uh, additional atoms. So for example, in this case, lithium atoms, which uh, are highly localized and concentrated here, providing even higher density of electrons and maybe uh, other mechanisms for coupling these electrons uh, in interesting ways. Now, what's missing from all this work is finite temperature effects. In fact, graphene, single layer graphene is not flat. It has lots of uh, uh, ripples and, and uh, interesting uh, deviations from planarity. Uh, and there's beautiful theoretical work along these lines from uh, David Nelson and co-workers, and I'm sure will uh, benefit greatly from studying these uh, works when we try to put together a, an atomic level uh, picture with uh, including electron phonon uh, coupling in at finite temperatures. Similarly, I showed you these uh, nice uh, domain walls between uh, commensurate and incommensurate phases. There's a beautiful theoretical uh, work uh, by uh, Bert Halperin and, and uh, uh, Susan Coppersmith and Daniel Fisher and co-workers uh, on the commensurate and incommensurate transition in two dimensions. Uh, and there's certain similarities here with the system that we are studying because the domain walls in that transition are uh, similar to the domain walls that I was describing and the dynamics of these may play an interesting role in uh, understanding the physics of the system. So this is it. I'll stop here uh, and uh, see if there are uh, any questions. Um, it looks like um, Subir has his hand raised and so does Professor Nelson. And Subir just put a question on the chat. Do you like okay, me to read so, it yeah. loud or do you want to just take that? So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm reading uh, Subir's uh, uh, chat message. So recent STM experiments on twisted bilayer graphene uh, at the Wiseman and Princeton groups uh, show the appearance of direct dispersions 
at rather high temperature, implying some symmetry breaking in which there is some polarization in valley, mini valley spin space. Uh, well, we're looking into these effects uh, and we do have uh, very interesting uh, symmetry breaking effects in the tri-layer system. Uh, I, I'm not aware of the symmetry breaking in the bilayer system, but uh, uh, we're exploring all these issues of how you can have these uh, uh, broken symmetry uh, situations. Uh, and I don't have uh, something uh, definitive to tell you, but this is something that we are looking very closely. Okay, thank you. So, so Tim, this is uh, David. C could I ask, ask my question? Please, David. Yeah, so, so thanks for the, the beautiful work. Um, and maybe you said this, but I missed it. Um, in the tri-layer tri systems, you have a theta one and a theta two. And have you had time to systematically scan this two-dimensional space and are the theories good enough to see which um, place in the theta one, theta two plane has the highest TC superconductivity? Is there any hope of answering yes. the question? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, yes, uh, we are, uh, okay, uh, I forgot to put the very last slide with the acknowledgements. These are the members of my group I showed, showed you, uh, uh, did some of the, um, uh, work that I described, uh, several other members, and uh, these are our collaborations. So let me just go back uh, and uh, talk a little bit more about the trilayer. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the trilayer is complicated because uh, even at large angles, you have very large uh, uh, patterns like you see here, okay? And because of this, you have very interesting uh, relaxations and so on, all of which conspire to produce these bands. Okay, so now this is for a specific set of angles, which are uh, shown up here. So the theta uh, one, two, and theta two, three are set equal in this case. We've done calculations with unequal angles, but you can imagine that each calculation is really quite complicated. So we're trying now to see if we can interpolate between these different values and do this kind of scanning of larger regions that you are talking about. So what we can do is provide guidance of where these special features of high density of states, possibly leading to correlated states and so on, come from. But not superconductivity itself. We need another level of theory to capture the uh, correlated superconducting state. Okay, then is there, I think you alluded to this early in the talk, is there a consensus that um, in these graphene systems, it's um, phonons, electrons? Well, uh, uh, no, as far as I know, well, there's no consensus. The field started out uh, uh, with very exciting ideas about uh, uh, just electron-electron interaction, no phonons. But as I'm suggesting here, uh, yes. because of the mod insulator phases. Right. But as I'm suggesting here, uh, you have bands all over the place. And uh, even in the bilayer system, you, you don't have just two bands. The, these two flat bands are very strongly interconnected, interrelated with the rest of the bands. So this to me suggests that uh, you need to take all this into consideration. So you have the localized electrons in the AA regions, but they couple also the walls, and this is very, Su suggestive of other features like the phonons playing an important role. Thank you. That's why I, I alluded to your work about all the uh, interesting vibrations and to Bert's work about the domain wall motion, which could also be very important. These white lines here are exactly the domain walls, uh, uh, the uh, equivalent of uh, the domain walls in, in uh, the commensurate insurate, uh, incommensurate transition in Bert's earlier work. Right, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, you have um, some in the chat. Okay. And uh, you've got a couple of hands raised. I don't know okay, if you can see. Okay, I don't see. see the chat, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, this is Zoe. Um, can you hear yes. me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you, Zoe. Please. Yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment. Please. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment to, uh, to David's question about the trilayer. Um, so we did do scans of uh, theta 1, 2, and theta 2, 3, so the two independent twisting angles. 
So as Tim just said, uh, all we can do is to map out the region where the density of states have a very sharp peak and also um, the width between the, the Van Hove singularity goes to zero. And so we do see um, enhancement in the density of states along a very smooth curve. So those twist angles are uh, basically, you can understand them as the perturbed twisted bilayer graphing, but the magic angle slightly change. Um, but we only make the prediction from a single particle level, as Tim just suggested. So uh, it's possible that electron phonon interaction is pay playing an important role. So we have to look at um, electron phonon coupling as well. But um, in our theory, it's only predicting electron electron correlation at this point. Like we are not including correlation, but we can only from a single particle point of view say which twist angles um, have very sharp density of states, and we all, we already saw that in our in our prediction. So it, in tri trialer, it is possible if you tune the two twist angles at the right values, and you will get uh, very sharp enhancement in the density of states. Um, okay. I guess for the experimental point of view is that uh, you can change the twist angle and see whether uh, your experiments observe correlated behaviors at the twist angle uh, where you see density of states enhancement. And then you can rule out whether you um, have, you agree with the strong electron correlation or you don't. So um, that's what's interesting about the system to me. Try Thank it. you, Joy. That's very, very helpful. Thanks. Okay, there's a few yeah. more hands. Let's see. Do you want to um, say something? Um, so, so that's that's Suzanne. Hello. Yes. <laughs> um, so I let let me ask a much more naive question. Um, from from talking to some of the experimentalists in this twisted um, bilayer system. My understanding is that these really small angles are really, really hard experimentally. Yes. And um, the question is whether with the tri-layer, where you already, as you said, you have, um, it's certainly harder to calculate because you have tri uh, three of them, but is it potentially easier to get some of the um, interesting effects with, tri with three layers than with two layers? Because apparently you don't need quite as small angles. Yes, uh, indeed, the angles where you see this interesting behavior is, uh, are, are quite larger than in the bilayer system. So from the theoretical point of view, it doesn't make the calculation easier because if the angles are a little different, then the overall moiré pattern is again very, very large. So only if you have large angles and the same angle, then things become a little bit easier from the theoretical point of view. But from the experimental point of view, it's certainly easier to try to put the, uh, layers together at a much larger angle. Uh, uh, nevertheless, we can scan these possible values, as uh, Zoe was also saying earlier, and point experiments toward the values that are more promising. Uh, and that's the whole excitement. That uh, So with three layers, we get much larger angles where we see interesting effects. Maybe with four layers, it'll be even easier. We don't quite know yet. That's why I said at the very end, we're trying to produce high throughput calculations to search for all these possibilities very fast. Thank you. So there were a couple of more uh, hands. Uh, Justina, do you still want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to ask about pressurizing the uh, trilayer yes. graphene. Do you have any predictions for how pressurizing the three layers would change the angles at which superconductivity occurs? No, we haven't done that calculation yet, uh, but I expect it will have a big effect there because a small compression percentage wise, uh, five or 10% can produce a huge change in the relative interaction between the layers. And that's what affects the bands and completely changes things and produces magic angle behavior at much larger twist angles. So uh, if we're lucky and this uh, effect uh, uh, persists for more layers, then uh, it's possibly uh, a good thing to do. However, I should also mention that it's not easy to apply pressure in experimental situations. Sure, thank you. I mean, it's easy for us because we just compress the layers and redo the calculation, but to, to do this, uh, to perform this experiment is really highly non-trivial. 
There's one more question in the chat window from Mahmoud. Okay. So let me try to read that. As you mentioned before, about room temperature superconductivity and coronavirus. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You want me to explain uh, high temperature superconductivity and coronavirus. Okay. Uh, uh, th this is a joke, okay? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not real <laughs> physics, but it's a good joke. So let me try to share it with you. So here's the paper. It was just uh, published. So novel approach to room temperature superconductivity. Let me just uh, share the screen with you so you can see it again. Can you see it? Novel approach to room temperature superconductivity problem. Okay, here we go. Instead of increasing the critical temperature TC of the superconductor, the temperature of the room was decreased to appropriate TC value. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> With very nice uh, figures, an actual experiment here set up. Uh, and uh, here, here is the picture of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very nice results with a superconductor floating in the room when the temperature is uh, uh, right, or the, the room temperature is right. <laughs> and here is the acknowledgement about the coronavirus. The authors acknowledge unprecedented circumstances of at home lockdown due to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And that's what made this uh, home experiment possible. Okay, <laughs> that's it. I just wanted to end with a joke. Okay, are there more questions? I should say, Tim, that that paper was posted on April 1. Yes, I know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so th um, any other questions or comments or jokes? <laughs> okay. All right, so thank you very much, Tim, for a great colloquium. And okay, next week, I want to advertise, so we'll have another condensed matter theorist, uh, Professor Bert Halper, in, uh, uh, speaking about also bilayers, quantum all affected bilayers. Um, so I hope uh, our faculty from other groups will also decide to give a colloquium. We're going to have a string of condensed matter colloquium anyway, <laughs> from okay. last week and this week and actually the next two weeks. All right, so okay. see you Thank next you week. Much, Thank you again. Bye-bye.